Good evening. We're going to take a few minutes as we let people join uh, for those who have registered. So give us a few minutes and we'll get started. I see there are a lot of people joining us, so this is great. We'll give people a few more minutes, like a minute or two more, and then we'll get started. I'm going to give everybody one more minute and then we'll get started. Okay, we got 6.33, so why don't we get started. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, it's nice on the first day of spring to actually be talking about open space. Um, so uh, let me introduce myself uh, yet again. My name is Mary Catherine Gibbs. I'm the land use attorney for HRP, the owner of the Potomac River Generating Site. It's nice to be back with you to talk about open space in and around the PRGS site. This is our 17th community engagement event that HRP has organized to discuss the redevelopment of the site. Tonight, we'll be discussing the further designs for the open spaces in and around the PRGS site, with a slight caveat that I'll explain later. Uh, before we begin, there are a few items we want to review to ensure everyone is still comfortable using Zoom. Um, for the audience members uh, on Zoom, please note you're muted on both camera and audio. We do this to ensure that we are able to efficiently review the materials and answer all your questions. If you're interested in asking questions or making comments, we ask that you either submit those through the Q&A function you should be seeing at the bottom of your screen or raise your hand in the question and answer period that will take place after we finished our presentation. We do ask that people who are asking questions verbally do so in a respectful time frame and manner so that as many people as possible get the opportunity to have their questions and comments addressed. If you wanna submit your question in writing, you can click on the Q&A icon where you'll then be prompted to type and submit your questions. We will try to log all uh, questions on our end. The chat function will not work. We'll be gathering questions received during the meeting and we'll answer as many as we can during the question and answer session. Any questions we're unable to cover in the time we have allotted for tonight's meeting will be saved so we can provide answers to all and then post them on our website in a couple of weeks. We are also recording this meeting and we'll post a recording of this meeting on our website as well. Uh, for those of you who are joining us by phone, you can send questions and comments to hrpinfomidatlantic at hilcoglobal.com. We'll do our best to check this email and ask and answer these questions during the meeting. If we're not able to answer your question during the meeting due to time limitations, we will share the answer along with all of the answer questions asked at our website, which is www.hrpalx.com, where the answers to all the questions asked during community meetings are posted. And has, as has been true of all of our community engagement events as part of this process, there'll be plenty of opportunity for community participation tonight. We're here to listen to your comments and answer your questions to the greatest extent we can. We'll be covering a lot of information and we'll leave plenty of time for questions. We can always go back to a slide during question and answers if you like. Again, thank you all for being here tonight and we'll go ahead and get started and I'll turn it over to Melissa Schrock. 
Thanks, Mary Catherine, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Melissa Schrock, and I lead the mixed use development team at HRP Nationwide. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you over the past three years and at community meetings and during our site tours. Next. <clears throat> We recently submitted our concept two for open space design. So tonight's meeting is gonna focus on reviewing the design of both the waterfront open space and what we call the rail corridor open space, which is located inland on the west side of the PRGS property. We will also touch on the abatement and deconstruction process. While we don't yet have a start date for that work, we anticipate that it may begin toward the end of this year so we wanted to provide a brief overview of how it's anticipated to be phased, estimated duration, and mitigation and communication measures that will be in place during the process. Then we'll cover next steps in the approvals process. And as Mary Catherine mentioned, take any questions you may have. Next. As many of you know, HRP specializes in remediating and reinvigorating former industrial sites across the country. PRGS is the fifth coal-fired power plant that will remediate, deconstruct, and transform. Here we'll be transforming the site into a welcoming waterfront district with a dynamic mix of uses, including housing and commercial, retail, arts, and cultural space, pedestrian and bicycle connections, and significant open space for the community to enjoy, which is our main topic for tonight. During the CDD phase, we developed these four principles that you see on the bottom of the screen. We developed these through the many, many conversations we had with community members, city staff, and city leaders. They are to integrate the site, connect people to the waterfront, provide meaningful open space, and to create a sustainable new place. Next. We've assembled a world-class team of professionals with expertise in a variety of disciplines, including architecture, engineering, environmental remediation, sustainability, and construction. All of these skills are necessary to take on the complex redevelopment project, such as PRGS. And tonight we'll hear from Simon Beer from OJB, our landscape architect on the fantastic public open spaces that will be delivered with the project. We know that some of you may be joining us for the first time tonight. So before we jump into open space design, we'll do a really quick review of where we're at in the approvals process. And as a reminder, all of our previous public meeting materials and formal submissions are available on our website, www.hrpalx.com. Mary Catherine. Thanks, Melissa. Um, we are really excited actually to be here to um, discuss the advancement of the plans for the open space with you. Um, we're here as we move through the third facet of the development review process for this site that you see here. The first was the CDD, which set the table for what comes next and provided the site's overall plan for the levels of development, including the uses, the heights, the amounts of open space, the blocks, and the initial roadways. That was approved in July of 2022. The CDD also established the developer contribution calculation that pays for the open space improvements we'll be talking about today. That contribution is the budget for these improvements and controls what can be programmed in these open spaces. Each step builds on the previous one. The second step was the infrastructure DSP approved in June of 2023, which laid out the roadway network and utilities necessary to support this development. The third step is now, while we're designing the buildings on the site, which we discussed at our last community meeting in November. An important public benefit for this development is the open space improvements in and around the site. Each building and open space has its own development special use permit or DSUP, and we have two uh, separate DSUPs for open space, the waterfront and what was called the rail corridor linear park. HRP made their concept to submission of their plans for these open spaces in January of 2024. Next slide. What we're showing you tonight is slightly different than the plans in the Concept 2 submission made in January. Why is there a difference in what was submitted in Concept 2 and what we'll be showing you now? After HRP submitted the Concept 2 submission on both the waterfront and the rail corridor linear park open spaces, we learned from the city attorney's office that we had to remove the plans for the linear park portion of the open space that sits on the Norfolk Southern property from our next submission called the preliminary DSUP submission. That area is highlighted in yellow uh, on the plans here tonight. We have to do that because the city hasn't advanced the acquisition of the Norfolk Southern property to the extent that HRP has an interest in the property that would satisfy the zoning ordinance. It's important to note that we have all been working together on the conversion of the Norfolk Southern line under a rails to trails conversion for a while now. 
The Old Town North Small Area Plan envisions the full extent of the Norfolk Southern Line, not just in front of the PRGS site, but all the way to Orinoco Street as part of a greater linear park. In the Rails to Trails program, only a municipality or a nonprofit property holder like the Northern Virginia Park Authority or a nature conservancy of some sort can be the entity to whom Norfolk Southern conveys the property. HRP is working on adjustments to the plans for the rail corridor open spaces on the south and southwestern sides of the project that are in more green, uh, just adjacent to that Norfolk Southern land as you see on the slide. Those plans are in, adjustments are in progress. We support the city's continued work on the acquisition from Norfolk Southern of the entire linear park that extends beyond this parcel. However, given that we don't know when the city might advance the acquisition of the Norfolk Southern property, and this project needs to keep moving forward, we have to focus our efforts and our resources on land that HRP controls. Now I'm gonna turn things over to Simon Beer of OJB, who's gonna walk through these incredible plans for these public open spaces. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Really appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to share some of the progress and developments that have been made uh, for the open spaces, both the, uh, the waterfront and uh, the rail corridor open space. We wanted to start with some of the process, uh, as Mary Catherine had outlined, uh, regarding uh, previous year's commitments to uh, this project and, and open space and a lot of that began with our initial community outreach all the way back in 2021. Uh, several of the community meetings that we've already had had focused on uh, open space um, and getting some of the program uh, desires of the community integrated into the design process. A big part of that was in 2023 when we held a community engagement process that uh, specifically involved uh, surveying community members uh, through a digital format and during a community meeting regarding uh, their desires for different programmatic elements within the open spaces. And we're excited tonight to share some of the fruition of that feedback in physical plans uh, for uh, each of the open spaces. As Mary Catherine mentioned, um, we have been submitting plans to the city as with the process uh, in the city of Alexandria, uh, recently with the concept to submission. Um, and you know, as each submission continues to go forth, uh, more detail and more information will be included uh, as is with the design process. So here, what we're showing you tonight is uh, concept two, uh, which is a conceptual design plan uh, and looking forward to sharing some of those graphics with you tonight. Uh, as Mary Catherine mentioned, uh, we will be sharing some of the progress with you and in progress of the removal of the Norfolk Southern land. Um, although uh, the design is being considered for the PRGS property, uh, still thinking about the future inclusion of that land for a cohesive design overall. Um, part of the community process uh, that we went through was the feedback on uh, the program and wanted to share some of those results tonight, just in a quick table. Uh, on the left-hand side uh, for the waterfront program, uh, waterfront uh, dining at the pump house was highly uh, touted. Uh, walking trails, a potential fitness loop, overlooks to the Potomac River, um, through this community survey process, we had over 800 responses and four different languages that were offered. Um, and this feedback has really helped us uh, to uh, continue the design development of these drawings. Uh, another few things that were uh, touted highly on the waterfront program was the replacement of the Mount Vernon Trail, uh, or the cage as we've been, uh, been calling it, and the inclusion of a personal watercraft launch. Along the rail corridor uh, in the linear open space, uh, shaded areas, uh, pop-up areas for activation and uh, different plazas, uh, the potential for uh, pollinator gardens and recreational facilities all ranked highly. And we'll cover some of those and their inclusion in the design through the process tonight. Of course, the, uh, the open space is a, uh, with the PRGS property and this development is a small piece of the larger ribbon uh, that exists throughout the edge of the Potomac River. 
uh, connecting up with Tide Lock Park all the way down to Orinoco Park uh, at the city's heart uh, of Old Town. This ribbon of green will continue north along the Potomac River in the PRGS property and also spur to the west, as Melissa mentioned, along the rail corridor open space. Um, again, highlighting uh, where we are in the process. Um, on the left is uh, an example of a plan that we've showed in, shown you in recent uh, community meetings uh, with not a lot of detail. And again, tonight we're gonna share a little bit more detail about how the programmatic response from the community fits into an overall park design and open space design here along the waterfront and along the linear park. So we'll start with the waterfront open space um, and start specifically to the north where quite a bit of this property at this peninsula um, at the edge of the Potomac River is National Park Service land. Our teams have had the opportunity to meet and uh, discuss closely with the National Park Service um, and uh, discuss integrating uh, these two distinct open spaces as one um, homogenous uh, design and thought. A big part of this uh, open space is the Mount Vernon Trail that exists today. And along with improvements to that, uh, that trail will be making additional connections to the Mount Vernon Trail, along with introducing overlooks to the Potomac River, uh, opportunities for bird watching and ecological education, woodland walks that span through this amazing existing woodland, uh, woodland area with stands of existing trees and the potential inclusion uh, of a personal non-motorized watercraft launch. I know that's a lot to put into, uh, uh, to say, but um, that's uh, uh, what you're seeing here located E as the non-motorized personal watercraft launch. And of course, that has access uh, to the development in the roadway where we'll have a uh, short-term drop-off for uh, those types of equipment to get down uh, directly to the Potomac River. Along with that, looking at the extent of the cage area in front of the pump house, which we'll get into in a little bit more uh, detail later. We have some additional views to share with you, and this kind of starts just at the north of that uh, pump house area. So you can see the removal of the, the cage, um, as well as some sight lines and reorienting of the Mount Vernon Trail uh, to uh, provide a safer connection along the waterfront for pedestrians and bikers. In the background, you can also see a gangplank that moves up and down with the tides that connects to the personal watercraft launch. Uh, the watercraft launch itself was a, a highly desirable program in our feedback from you and have worked with the National Park Service to uh, look at its inclusion in the program plan here. Uh, there's quite a bit of grade change from the uh, development and the new roadways within the infrastructure plans down to the water, but making sure that there's always accessible pathways um, as well as uh, means for people to get down to the water. So here from the streetscape, uh, an accessible route that slopes gently down to the Mount Vernon Trail, as well as a staircase with a personal, non-motorized personal watercraft uh, ramp uh, to easily access the uh, watercraft launch. Here's another bird's eye view of that, and you can start to see the kind of infrastructure of this uh, non-motorized personal watercraft launch on its connection to the Potomac River. In order to get to the depths required for uh, such activities, this gangplank extends into the water and connects to a, a floating piece here. Uh, you can see in the background, um, the pump house and the trail without the cage, uh, that's actually more gracious and generous uh, than certainly more gracious and generous than currently uh, designed improving sight lines as we make our way around uh, this existing infrastructure. As we get to the pump house, I uh, wanted to share a quick section of that to convey some of the, uh, the grade change. At the streetscape, you're at about 36 uh, and getting down to zero at the Potomac River uh, with tidal fluctuations kind of in, uh, tied into that. You can see the extent of the uh, walkway, uh, the Mount Vernon Trail extension in front of that, and the opportunities on the pump house for great views out to the Potomac River. As we get into a little bit more detail on the location of this pump house and the open space associated with it, 
uh, it has strong connections back to the development, but even stronger connections to the Potomac River. Um, accessibility, again, has been a key factor of how we can get down to the river as well as promote views to the river. Um, in addition to the personal watercraft launch uh, and the Mount Vernon Trail bridge replacement, uh, we'll be including overlooks and a great lawn along with uh, shade structures and uh, shade swings. And the inclusion, of course, of uh, overlooks to the Potomac and uh, reinforcing the native ecologies out here along the banks of the Potomac River with native planting gardens um, and uh, native planted slopes along the water. Um, as we get closer to the pump house, uh, you can see how much more gracious uh, this view is, um, still accommodating for bicyclists uh, that need to use the Mount Vernon Trail uh, going from south to north and north to south. But uh, along with uh, some opportunities for people to come out to the edge of the water, both at the lower level and the upper level where we provide a public overlook. And of course, stairs can come down along the south side of the pump house, uh, graciously introducing you uh, and uh, giving you view corridors out to the Potomac River, along with native planting, as well as an accessible ramp, uh, accessible walkway uh, that meanders some of the grade to get you down to the water. Along with that, uh, that meandering pathway, uh, there will be seating opportunities that uh, allow you to stop for respite and views to the water. Here's a quick section of that staircase, again, kind of highlighting the grade changes from the street uh, down to the water the, at the Potomac River and some of the challenges with that, but opportunities that have been uh, provided with great view corridors out towards the water. On top of the pump house, no better view uh, to the Potomac than uh, up here with unobstructed uh, natural views. Uh, and again, that was highly touted as um, something that the community was looking for, along with uh, potential opportunities as that pump house develops uh, for waterside dining um, and uh, uh, the ability to provide that both here at the, uh, the pump house uh, roof and below. As we move back a little bit further, you can start to see some of those uh, native planting gardens along with integrated seating that moves along uh, with the Wooner uh, to the right side. And that Wooner, uh, again, here in view, while it's not part of the open space, was part of the infrastructure plan, certainly designed in unison um, as part of the overall approach to the development and uh, to the open space. In the background, we can start to see the shade structure at the Great Lawn uh, with great accessibility to that as it uh, works with the Great Lawn itself. And here's a view of the meandering pathway uh, that gets you down accessibly to the water with these areas of respite, both kind of looking back at the planting and the development as well as out towards the, uh, towards the Potomac River. Um, as we move into the kind of Great Lawn area, we're providing shade structures, uh, which was uh, another uh, item. Shade was really important to the community during the feedback. And along with the shade, we're introducing some playful moments of uh, these porch swings uh, that are integrated into the infrastructure of that um, with, uh, again, accessible, movable uh, uh, seating and uh, furniture throughout uh, some groves that are located here. As we move to the Great Lawn itself, the size of this and kind of uh, prominence of it on uh, the edge of the open space provides for great views both to the water and to the raised stage at the trellis. So we're thinking at the day to day that this trellis is going to be really useful for people to come out and enjoy a sandwich, uh, have a good talk with a friend, but can have the flexibility to kind of ramp up to be a, a focal point for everything that you're seeing here uh, uh, below the shade structure. So the shade structure kind of has a duality of use on the day-to-day -day and for a programmed event. And here's a quick cross-section through that uh, great lawn uh, that you see here with accessibility moving along the edge of it. There is a, a rock a scramble here that helps to retain some of that flat lawn for events and can also be playful, uh, a climbing element, as well as seating moments uh, uh, again, for these great views out towards the water. 
As we move south uh, around Block B and Block A, uh, the open space really uh, continues to open up in unison with the National Park Service land. Um, native planting uh, that occurs along the slope that goes down to the Mount Vernon Trail, along with strong connections to the Mount Vernon Trail from the roadway and streetscape. Uh, Block A is intended as a arts use building, and while we're still uh, kind of contemplating the potential uses for that, uh, certainly want the landscape and the open space to, uh, to accent and complement those uses. So we're including some uh, movable seating zones and areas, as well as uh, potential retail uh, dining zones. Um, and to the south, uh, another potential for an arts use lawn, event lawn uh, that has association with uh, Block A's art use. Um, also thinking of this as a great gateway open space moment as you enter into the PRGS property. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in association with the uh, linear open space, the rail corridor open space as well. So a few views of that along the streetscape, uh, we're looking at uh, bioretention features uh, to help mitigate some of the stormwater from the roadways, as well as creating these accessible walkways down to the Mount Vernon Trail. And as we face south, you can see the Block A building over here to our right with uh, the potential for retail, but uh, the water side of Block A is really a promenade that continues this open space experience uh, as you move uh, from north to south. And that experience is accentuated with uh, uh, movable seating and areas to stop um, and enjoy the views to the Potomac uh, in a shaded, uh, well landscaped zone. Uh, integrating overlooks at key moments uh, along uh, the water's edge. Uh, that has great uh, promontory out towards the water, again, uh, ranking highly as a portion of um, the community feedback for these overlooks. So these are all kind of uh, sprinkled along uh, the edge at uh, great promontory moments. And getting to the south edge here where we see the potential for an event lawn uh, with pop-up activation, uh, a lot of flexibility here and how we can um, look at uh, different uh, events that can occur here uh, along the south edge. And here's a quick section of that as it moves down towards the Potomac River, integrating the widened Mount Vernon Trail um, and uh, the kind of architecture uh, that it uh, is associated with. And we're going to move into the rail corridor open space uh, and talk about some of the design planning there. Again, for the purposes of our presentation tonight, we're really focused on, uh, on the right side, uh, the rail corridor open space and not the Old Town North Linear Park Segment 2, um, as that's part of the Norfolk Sutherland. But um, as our team continues to develop the design specifically for the rail corridor open space, uh, we will be uh, looking at a cohesive approach to how the North, uh, Old Town North Linear Park can be uh, accommodated with that. So here, uh, as a gateway moment, uh, there's a gateway plaza as you enter in from the Fairfax Extension, and uh, uh, a moment there for art and sculpture um, and gateway architecture, along with a, a plaza um, and an open, flexible lawn associated with that. The guard house is an existing uh, structure that uh, our team plans to repurpose um, and with uh, potential for bathrooms um, and small retail or bike shop as we continue to contemplate uh, the best condition for, uh, for that. That also has a plaza associated with it uh, that um, can function along with the guard house. A quick view of that, you can see some fixed and flexible seating here. Uh, the ability for parents, uh, guardians to sit uh, within the plaza and look out to the flexible lawn uh, and the guardhouse beyond. Another view of that here is the guardhouse behind us, again with a potential function for uh, bathroom facilities and small retail. Um, as we move further north, um, while this is still a uh, kind of uh, more linear open space, thinking about the opportunity for native planting gardens, uh, additional passive lawn areas, 
and kids play, which uh, in the narrow kind of condition that we have, uh, not considering the Old Town North Linear Park, one of our uh, design team's considerations is uh, increasing the footprint of this and potentially moving it to a location with uh, a, a broader expanse uh, for the kids area. And then also uh, the potential for a recreation lawn. So more active uh, uh, things happening within this zone like uh, soccer um, or field sports. Of course, along all of this with the native planting gardens, thinking about shade and comfortable seating moments throughout. And here you can see some of those uh, along this edge with the integration of a fitness loop that's associated with this linear park as well. And getting further north, um, the uh, design team is looking at a potential dog run uh, along with that expansive recreation lawn uh, for soccer and yard games. Uh, fitness stations that are integrated throughout uh, that are associated with that uh, fitness loop as well. Um, integrating those uh, native planting gardens throughout, uh, along with buffering some of the Petco, uh, sorry, Pepco um, uh, substation infrastructure, um, and looking at the streetscape edge as the potential for uh, Grove Courts, uh, with uh, bringing in potentially uh, board games and uh, table games along with that for additional program. So here's a quick view of that recreation lawn. Uh, again, lots of flexibility here. Wanted to find a footprint that was large enough to accommodate for field sports like uh, this, uh, this soccer game that's occurring. Um, all nestled it within edges of native planting gardens and tree shade trees along the edge. As we move and kind of spur off towards the uh, Pepco substation, wanted to highlight some of the landscape and open space features uh, associated with uh, this uh, stretch of public realm. Uh, the Pepco substation is, uh, we're looking at opportunities for a planted and artistic screening, uh, again, to help to uh, minimize the kind of use towards that infrastructure. Um, using this as a public infrastructure uh, and sidewalk, as well as uh, a larger zone here for landscape that's a little bit more subdued uh, with uh, some gathering, uh, garden gathering moments um, uh, that may occur. So uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Nick to speak just a little bit about uh, abatement and deconstruction on the project. Thank you, Simon, uh, appreciate the handoff. And hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Blair, I'm the VP of uh, development out of our Chicago office, and I'm going to be speaking to the abatement and deconstruction uh, of the uh, uh, Core River Generating Station. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a sequencing plan that we have uh, shared previously. Just wanted to uh, present it again so everyone's familiar with it. Uh, generally, how we're going to move through the project with abatement, then followed by deconstruction, um, is from south to north, so starting with the coal yard in sequence A, which is on the, the right-hand side of the image here, um, and then working towards uh, the, the buildings themselves, um, with the auxiliary buildings being sequence B, kind of the green area, which is the second um, phase of work here, followed by the turbine hall, um, which is sequence C, and then uh, last area will be the powerhouse. Um, and generally, the, the way we're following this is just uh, how the work naturally progresses uh, through the site. Next slide, please. Um, so again, an, another slide here that we've presented several times, but reiterating our mitigation measures that we put in place on our deconstruction and abatement projects. Um, so our general contractor and deconstruction contract, we're putting a road and control plan in place. Um, once we get on site, um, implementing those measures prior to actually starting the work. From a noise control perspective, we'll be following all you know, local code and requirements as well as doing noise monitoring to make sure that we're not exceeding those uh, the audible levels uh, as part of those requirements. Uh, from a vibration monitoring perspective, um, we'll be obviously monitoring our, our movements on site, you know, but most notably the switch yard and then our neighboring abutting uh, properties at the property line to make sure again, we're not disturbing anyone off our property. In all of our projects, we do an existing condition survey on site as well as at the, the perimeter um, and near our neighboring properties. Again, just understand the conditions of the, the, the properties prior to the start of our work 
And then again, during um, our work as well to make sure that we are not affecting anyone. Um, <clears throat> dust uh, mitigation and monitoring, uh, very you know large focus of ours. Uh, water is really our, our best approach here. Um, using ample amount of water during all the abatement and demolition um, or deconstruction activities. Um, so that'll be, you know, kind of mitigant number one. Uh, number two will be our dust monitoring program, uh, which is really at the perimeter and then sometimes, you know, kind of at a point of work. And the, the point of the, the dust monitoring program is to make sure that our mitigants, that water that we're using, the deconstruction methods that we're using, the abatement techniques that we're using, um, are not creating dust that are leaving, you know, the general work work area, and that's what the monitoring program will do. And then last, our abatement approach, um, very straightforward, you know, as we do on all of our projects. We'll identify where the asbestos is, which was part of the fact-finding mission that we've been talking about for some time now, which uh, we're bringing to a close. We'll set up containments uh, within the buildings or around the buildings that we have to do abatement. We'll remove uh, the asbestos and other regulated materials during that time. Again, using ample amount of water and monitoring our work to make sure that we're not uh, having any uh, asbestos or other uh, materials leaving those containment areas. Um, and then once we conclude the removal process, uh, we'll go through and what we call our final clearances. And that's a series of um, sampling and visual inspections to make sure that there are no um, regulated materials or asbestos left in the buildings or on the buildings prior to our deconstruction. Uh, and then last and foremost, but also very important, is our community uh, communication plan. Uh, so prior to the actual deconstruction commencement, um, we'll have a, a series of um, community meetings to provide updates, in, uh, not only as to who our contractors are going to be, but as to how they're going to approach this and uh, their demolition and abatement methods. Uh, and then we'll have our <clears throat> uh, project website and as well as our 24 seven um, hotline um, and then we'll be posting um, regularly our look ahead schedule so you can understand, you know, what we're doing in the current moment, as well as where we're headed in the next few weeks. Uh, and then on a monthly basis, up, uh, uploading all of our dust monitoring reports um, so that you can uh, see how our, our work has uh, been completed. Next slide, I believe I'm going to turn it over to Mary Catherine. I think you are, Nick. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Can you go to the next slide, Simon? Uh, you can see here a summary. Uh, there you go. A summary of how we've reached this point so far in the light gray uh, to the left here. If you've come to any of our meetings, you have uh, seen a number of these uh, progressions as we go from light gray to or dark gray to light gray. Um, we've had a number of community events, uh, community meetings related to open space so far, and we had a first look at the buildings in the first three blocks of the site as well. We're here uh, at the community meeting 17 to solicit your input. Um, we've also presented these plans to the Waterfront Commission uh, and to the Urban Design Advisory Commission called UDAC uh, in late February and earlier this month. We'll also be reviewing these plans with the Parks and Rec Commission this Thursday, March 21st. Um, then we'll be advancing the designs for the first three blocks and the open spaces with our completeness submissions later this spring. And we're looking forward to moving towards planning commission and city council hearings uh, in the latter part of 2024. Um, with that, we are going to open it up to questions. So why don't we start? We have a few that are in uh, the question box. Um, and um, first one is, where would people park trailers associated with the personal watercraft? Simon, would you mind going back to that? slides so we can show there's actually a specific drop-off uh, zone for um, uh, dropping off vehicles that have or excuse me dropping off kayaks or personal watercraft um, so that there's space for people to do that and then they would have to uh, move their cars to the parking that we'll be providing And Mary Catherine, I will just point that out here on the screen. It would be this uh, parallel parking extent. Uh, Could you possibly go to the one that's a little bit closer in? So yeah, absolutely. One. absolutely. I think that might be easier to read. Look ahead a little bit. So that'll be on this screen at the waterfront. Yeah. So E here is the personal watercraft launch, non-motorized, uh, that gangplank. 
And then uh, this area here uh, that you see is parallel parking, which can accommodate up to four cars uh, or two cars with trailers. Um, and they would have short-term uh, parking abilities with uh, a sidewalk that connects you directly down or accessibly uh, via a sloped sidewalk uh, here. Okay. Uh, next question. We actually got um, we got a question in advance, and so I want to, and it's sort of related to one we've already gotten in the the question and answer box. Um, related to um, uh, seeing as many trees as possible on the site, um, and then we had a question about um, old growth trees in Old Town North, um, and could we comment on plans to maintain or encourage um, old growth trees? Do you want to take that one, Simon? Well, let me start if you don't mind. There are two different answers for that, depending on where the open space is. Um, we, the open spaces in the rail corridor park do have the transmission lines uh, for the distribution of power from the substation underground. So while we have permission to install landscaping, where exactly the trees go will have to be coordinated to where those transmission lines are. Thanks, Mary Catherine. And yeah, the existing trees throughout the site um, are really incredible. And our design team has taken uh, great strides to look at the grading uh, of the site uh, as it relates to the connection to the National Park Service land. Um, you know, fortunately, a lot of uh, the PRGS property is void of old growth trees, but will soon be uh, implemented with great street trees throughout um, and open space uh, throughout with new growth trees. Um, but the uh, extent of the existing trees are, uh, for the majority of, of the open space, preserved and protected in place. Uh, specifically, we have uh, reviewed a lot of the health of the existing trees um, and have kept that in mind throughout the design process. Thanks, Simon. Uh, the next one uh, is a, a comment and a question. Uh, looks like a lot of concrete. Um, where are the unorganized areas for families to have picnics in nature? Uh, looks commercially oriented. Uh, I think that, um, Simon, if you, I think you walked us through what is a significant amount of um, a dispersion of different types of active and passive uses, um, but perhaps what you might be seeing is the gray concrete above the pump house that's right there. Um, but um, if you might let me go through what do you think the uh, dimensions of that um, great lawn at F are or some, you know, talk a little bit about the, the space uh, there uh, so people can understand it's not mostly concrete. Absolutely, Mary Catherine. And I think we actually have an exhibit here that kind of highlights the scale of some of these open spaces. So just looking at that great lawn, um, you know, 90 by 115, uh, 8,600 square feet. Um, the edges, the kind of streetscapes where people would be walking, uh, certainly with concrete, but a limited approach to the hardscape uh, that's within these open spaces to promote more green, uh, more um, filtration uh, through the existing soil and really uh, trying to hone in on programmatic spaces where, uh, where potential plazas may be uh, that are really scaled appropriately uh, for, uh, for the type of space. That kind of also goes for uh, the waterfront open space here, a kind of pathways that connect you uh, to the trails and open space, but a majority of green pervious area uh, throughout. And that actually um, goes to, we had another question about the indication of the scale of the Great Lawn and other paths besides the Mount Vernon Trail. So thanks, I think that answers that question uh, as well. Um, we have a question about uh, where the water used uh, to keep the dust uh, goes. Um, and so Nick, do you want to answer that question about what happens with that water? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mary Catherine. Yes, so the, the water for dust mitigation, I'm gonna uh, talk about this in two different pieces. So water for dust mitigation um, during abatement inside a containment, all that water is collected and then disposed of um, as waste as, as it's you know, been contaminated with the asbestos. During uh, demolition or deconstruction, that water um, is captured and then is either used as additional um, dust mitigation, and then you know, towards the end of the project, we will analyze it if it's um, ready for discharge or removal from the site. Um, so that's generally how we'll, we'll handle that uh, type of water. All right, thanks. 
Um, we have a question about, um, uh, are we planning to retain any of the railroad tracks that travel through the property for historical purposes? Will you assure that the landscape architects for the project have certification for native plantings? Um, Simon, I think uh, you do. Um, but do you want to, um, Melissa, do you want to answer the question about railroad tracks? Or Simon, do you want to, you showed some in your drawings. So you guys work on that one. Um, sure, I can speak to the railroad tracks. So um, there actually are not railroad tracks that run through our property anymore. Uh, they were hazardous uh, to a lot of the public tours that we were doing. Um, so we did uh, pull them up. However, we retained the track itself, the pieces of track, it's in segments, um, so that we could plan ways to use them creatively in the future and integrate them into the landscape design. Uh, but there's there's the tracks that you see if you walk by the site are actually outside our property line. Those are the Norfolk Southern tracks. And I think that actually relates to a question that we just got about um, uh, has there been any thought for demolition to using the existing rail infrastructure to assist with the demolition activities to reduce the need for trucks to enter and exit the site? The, those uh, tracks are not working. Uh, they are overgrown with um, uh, uh, with plantings. And so uh, cars, rail cars don't travel on those tracks anymore. And so no, those tracks will not be used um, for part of the demolition. Mary um, Catherine, I do see a question uh, that pertains to the potential reuse of those. And maybe I didn't mention it in the uh, rail corridor open space, uh, looking at the implementation of uh, using the, the rail pieces within the paving as a gesture to the site's history as well as uh, potential reuse of infrastructure uh, from, the, um, from the actual power plant itself in the landscape as a folly um, and working with the city to identify uh, what those objects may, uh, may be. And that's kind of part of our design process as well. Um, and to answer the, the native planting question, we have uh, a lot of uh, amazing talented people here in our office that are well versed in uh, the native ecologies and planting of the region. Um, and the question I think kind of dives in a little bit more about not just uh, planting gardens, but holistically uh, looking at a native uh, flora throughout. And that is absolutely the intent, along with uh, National Park Service land, which uh, entails a more native ecology, uh, the rest of the site follows suit uh, with how that's implemented throughout and enhanced on the National Park Service land as well. Thanks, Simon. Um, we have a question from someone who joined late. Um, uh, when is demolition anticipated to start? Nick, do you want to take that question? I can do that. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, we, we said this at the beginning, but if you join late, you might not have heard it. We, we don't have a start date as of yet, but we do expect that it may begin before the end of this year. So we did just want to provide that brief update Tonight, as Nick said, before we start, uh, formally, we will have a series of, of meetings that will be able to provide uh, more detail to the, to the community, including having the, the contractors that are actually selected to do the work uh, present more detail on um, the means and methods that they will employ, and then we'll go through the uh, mitigation measures as well and the, the communication plan in more detail. Thanks. Um, we have a, qu a question about the how will the event lawn be connected to Fairfax Street? How is p pedestrian access planned? Simon, do you want to take that one? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So Fairfax currently uh, kind of, and I'll go to a, maybe we can see on this view, um, the way Fairfax kind of moves, it ends here at uh, the intersection of the Mews. And uh, the proposal here is that this is a, an extension of Fairfax that moves into the site uh, right between block A and block B. So this is gonna be a really special moment, both for the open space and the architecture uh, with that view going directly towards the Potomac River as you enter into the site from uh, where Fairfax uh, turned um, current, turns currently. So yeah, there will definitely be pedestrian access to the um, uh, to the Great Lawn with <laughs> a significant said, series of new paths. Very simply, just said very simply, it will be connected by a sidewalk. <laughs> a gracious exactly. pedestrian. Just to be road. clear, oh, yep. Simon. Yep. 
Uh, we have a question on, uh, we'll, um, we'll be submitting completeness drawings for the first three buildings. Will these be preliminary design level? And yes, that's called the preliminary site, uh, the preliminary submission, uh, the development special use permit uh, submission. So yes, uh, they will be. Um, we had a question about, and it actually relates to the interconnectivity between, or the inner use of the trails by pedestrians and, and bikes, uh, and uh, that can have some conflicts, and how are we uh, working towards uh, reducing those conflicts. The question was essentially, the exact question was, will bikes be prohibited from open space areas? And the answer is no, they won't be prohibited. Um, but Simon, do you want to take how you actually worked on the design to ensure that the conflicts are limited? Absolutely. And, and part of that is offering a multitude of options for bicyclists uh, throughout the site. One being, of course, the Mount Vernon Trail, uh, which we talked about the potential for pedestrians to connect down to as well. It is a multi-use trail, uh, but the widening of that is going to help support that along with smart connections to the Mount Vernon Trail. And specifically in front of the pump house where we anticipate a lot of activity, um, that will, there will be a material change along with signage um, and ground graphics uh, along the trail uh, to help encourage the uh, recognition that it's a mixed, uh, mixed use trail um, and that pedestrians will be crossing. Uh, we're looking at a more tactile um, notification for that. But along with the Mount Vernon Trail, there's also a bike trail that goes through uh, the current Norfolk Southern Land uh, that connects out to the George Washington Memorial Parkway. And the streetscapes will off also offer sharrows and bike lanes uh, to help accommodate and support uh, bicyclists coming into this development. Thanks. Um, we have a question. Um, will we be retaining any infrastructure from the existing plant as a nod to the extort use of the site? Um, Melissa, do you want to take that one? Or Simon, you talked a little bit about the reuse of potential ones uh, earlier. So go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, that's part of our plan and part of our conversations with the city. It's a, a comprehensive plan over um, uh, the nod to the industrial heritage of this site um, and introducing that as elements into the landscape as well as part of the architecture. Um, we have a, a question as it relates to um, the process for uh, uh, getting contractors on the site. Um, Nick, do you want to answer that question? Who's the proper contact is the question. Um, so the, the best way to get in touch with the, the team um, is just go through our uh, online website and you can reach out that way for the specific project. Specifically to the abatement and deconstruction, we ran a request for qualification process over the last year that rolled into an actual bid process that was spearheaded by our general contractor, Balfour Beatty. Uh, but we'll be able to get you in touch with Balfour, um, our general contractor, and then myself, uh, who oversees demolition and abatement um, for our portfolio across the country. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and we have a, a question about um, uh, potential contaminants. Is, um, are all the contaminants known? Melissa, do you want to take that question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, we've done some public meetings in the past uh, with our environmental remediation team where we've done a much deeper dive on this topic. So uh, full, for, first, a disclaimer that I am not uh, an em environmental remediation expert, but what I can tell you is that when we bought the property in 2020, we entered it into what's called the Voluntary Remediation Program. Uh, that's administered by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. So we entered it into the VRP, administered by the VDEQ. As part of that process, we went through a sampling uh, of the constituents on the site. So sampling acro across the site, both uh, ground soil and also ground water. They um, gave us feedback, as did the city, on our sampling plan. We did those samples that gave us an, uh, an idea of what we can find on the site. Um, there are some underground storage tanks. There was an existing underground storage tank that had um, a release from it during the prior ownership, and they put into place uh, remedial actions uh, related to that release which we took over when we um, when we purchased the property. So we uh, sort of inherited an existing known condition that we're continuing uh, to remediate and deal with. It is actually 
kind of under the building and behind the existing uh, sort of seawall or river wall, sheet wall that's out um, uh, at the Potomac. And then obviously there are other uh, constituents in, in the site that will be uh, dealt with. So the, the goal is to bring the property to full regulatory closure. The exact uh, remediation plans are currently uh, being developed, but a lot of it will be implemented in parallel with with the future development. If you want to know more about this, um, I would suggest there's an existing, uh, we did a public meeting on this last January. So it was around uh, January, 2023. Uh, and you could uh, reference that from our website. Again, that's www.hrpalx.com. And you can see a whole presentation on the uh, remedial approach to the property. Thanks, Melissa. Um, we had a, a question, actually a comment from Melissa Kunin um, to, to remind people that the industrial use of the site was only a short period following the agricultural use of the land since the revolution. So thanks for that. Um, uh, next uh, one we got was um, from a resident at Towngate um, North. Welcome to Alexandria. Uh, are there any plans to harvest hydroelectric energy from the movement of the Potomac River? Um, and actually, we uh, talked about that as part of the um, coordinated sustainability strategy. Um, and I, I don't, I, if I recall correctly, Melissa, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there isn't enough either movement or difference in the temperature between the water and your site to make either of those uses um, viable for your site. That's correct. Okay. Um, are we going to be offering any more site tours? That's a good question. I don't know that we have an answer for that yet. <laughs> um, we've. I think we will probably do that a bit later this year. We haven't picked a date yet. They've been obviously very, very popular. I think over the past three years, you know, we've had um, we've been able to welcome over a thousand or close to a thousand people uh, to the site. So we think it's a great thing to do to open it up uh, to the community. Obviously, it's a very curious. Um, you know, building uh, in the site. And I, I understand that the community's interest in, in getting a look inside. All right. Well, that was the last question in the question and answer session. And we actually answered the one we got before uh, the meeting. Oh, we just got one, a comment. Um, attended a planning committee meeting last year. Your patience is amazing. That's very nice of you. Confident you've gone overboard to consider the community in this project. Uh, the attention to detail with design and remediation is obvious. Thanks for all your work. Ready to see the power, power plant come down. Thank you so much for that comment. We, we really appreciate it. I think recognizing that this is the 17th community meeting that we've had, I think a lot is that point. Uh, so thank you very much. As Melissa said at the beginning of this meeting, um, HRP has really put together a very professional uh, crew of people because uh, it, it's, it's an important project uh, and it's important to get it right. So thank you for that. There's a question about whether someone will be certified by a particular certification program, the Chesapeake Bay Professional Certification Program. And I don't know that I know the answer to that question, um, but we can certainly look into that. Simon, do you know? We will certainly look into that for you. Of course, we're uh, licensed in, in the state and uh, have, uh, have done several projects uh, with the city of Alexandria in the past. Um, we'll look into that certification program. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's, there have been some really good questions. I think this is a lot of information about open space, but this is a really important aspect in terms of the, the public benefits. Um, and uh, really excited to be able to show you uh, the public benefits that are a part of this project. And so, as we said, we're going to be continuing to move forward uh, and looking forward to uh, getting to public hearings later this year on the buildings and the open spaces. Thanks.